Thanks for tuning in to Becoming Something, where we promise to keep the conversation honest and real for young adults in their 20s and 30s. Every moment we live is training for a future moment, and that's why we do this podcast, because we want you to be prepared for everything that life is going to throw at you. Our hope with this podcast is that it would help you become all that God desires you to be. So with that in mind, let's jump right in to this week's episode of Becoming Something. What's up, podcast world? It's your boy, JP. In the, not really in the podcast studio, but on the stage with my friend, Kathy Davidson. What's up, guys? How are we doing? Good. Good to see you guys. And Nathaniel Hildenkamp. Let's go! Come on! Hey, hey my baby is back, so that? she is not scarred for life. So if you could just donate to my Venmo to pay for her counseling. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Poor JC. Like CPS on you, bro. Honestly, you jumped off the stage with your child. Good. Not your best moment. You're... A bit of a programming change. So Bree said we were about to do something, but we want to do everything we possibly can do to make this weekend as impactful as possible for y'all. So we've just been hearing a lot of different things. You said, hey, we would prefer a Q&A with Nate instead. Oh so JP gosh. and Kathy are going to go in the audience. And... No, no. I don't, I don't know my Bible like you. We should so. put it on the spot, truly. <laughs> That's a hot and I don't want it, so Nate, you, you take it. Hey, I just, uh, so this will be fun. So <laughs> Nate and Kathy will go out there. They'll fill questions from you guys. Here's the deal. Like I said yesterday, there is, uh, th- there's like an awkwardness to this where it feels like, oh, you're the answer man, the answer guy. And that's, that is not our heart. That's certainly not my heart. And so what I think about this is like the, the part of the message where you, you come, uh, you know, afterwards up at the stage and like people want to ask questions. So this is a, a place for you to ask anything you want. It is going to be on the podcast just so you're not surprised. And so people might hear your voice asking questions, but they won't know who you are. It, but you it's can, only 1.6 million people. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, No one listens. But it's you fine. can ask anything. Like truly, I, I, it, you don't need to, sometimes we'll do this and people will come up and say, like, Hey, I didn't want to ask this in front of everyone. I'm like, you're not doing me any favors. Like I don't, I don't care what you ask, and uh, yeah, we're we're thankful that you guys are here. We had a great time yes. last night. Super, Y'all are awesome. super fun. So, with that said, let's. Uh, anybody have a question? No question. Okay, here we go. Wow. Hey, I asked this question yesterday um, about discipleship and with having guy friends specifically. If there's no other like godly guys for you to kind of hook them up with to be friends, how on earth do you navigate that? Yeah, it's a great question. And so, uh, you know, for a long time, I would teach that guys and girls were not meant to be friends. And I was reading the Bible one day, <laughs> and, and Jesus was hanging out at Martha and Mary's house. And so I was reading a commentary on that passage because I was going to teach it. And it just said, hey, this is interesting because Jesus had fans. He had followers. He had the, the 12. But then he also had friends. Yep. And it said Mary and Martha were her friends. And so I was like, okay. I, I think I've overcorrected. I think I've said something stronger than the scripture does right here. Uh, I would give you a word of caution that usually when a guy and a girl are friends, one of those hearts is, is drifting. Mm-hmm. And so this comes from, you yeah. know, over a decade of, of meeting with one of those people that really is, is mourning a relationship that never happened. And so you do have to be wise in that. And, and I would ask that person more questions around like, hey, if I don't have any other God-fearing guys in my life that I can direct him to, why is that? Is that a, you know, am I, am I at a healthy church? You know, what is going on? And there's good answers to that. So that's not like meant to be this heavy-handed call out. There could be really good logical answers to that question, but I think it's a good question, you know, to ask first. Like, hey, why do I not have a bunch of guys that I can hand him off to and say, hey, you should meet with them? And... You know, it's, it's like my, I have uh, a daughter who's moving toward the age where guys are starting to notice her and ask her out, and you have like the homecoming, those kinds of dances and stuff. And even, you know, something that we talk with her about is just like to say, hey, I only spend time with people who follow Jesus. And, and I'd be lying to you if I said I've never heard the story where, you know, a guy said, hey, that's what spurred me to get into the church. I was really doing it just for a girl. 
but now I fell in love with a savior. And that happens often, but that's, that's the way that I would think about that is, okay, do I really not have any God-fearing guys that I can hand him off to? Um, it's okay if I am uh, a friend that points him to Christ, but I need to probably continue to DTR, like, hey, just so you know, I'm doing this from a platonic, like, I'm just, just a friend, don't want to set you up, don't, uh, for failure in that. And, um, and then if it was like someone you were interested in, just say, hey, I, I, like, I only am interested in people who love Jesus with our, all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. It is, like, it is really frustrating because I have a lot of strong girls around me, two of them being right here. And it seems like during the college age time, like all, a lot of my super close, like godly guy friends moved for college. And all the guys that I used to be like, oh yeah, go hang out with them. Because yeah. They're like Jesus. Yeah. They're gone. <laughs> and yeah. like, I don't know why there's yeah. no other strong godly guys close to me. I'm not even joking. Like half the guys I know still smoke yeah. weed and they're like, I never read my Bible. And yeah. I'm like, why though? <laughs> and, I, and it's so frustrating. I know those guys. So it's so yeah. frustrating. Also, you could probably talk on like why weed is um, yeah. wrong anyways, but. Yeah, I think and just, just to work to fill that bank up, you know, to get involved in, a, in an active church where there are, you know, where they're making disciples. That's good. Okay. Uh, my question is, what is the best and the hardest part about ministry? What is well, the so the best is clearly yeah. what we're going to be. What is so, it? Is it? You, you are the answer to one of those questions. That's true. <laughs> maybe, maybe not that uh, one. So I want to I say this because uh, as, as of now, no one's violated this. So this is not uh, reactive, but proactive. Just as you ask questions, I, I know that, that sometimes these Q&As can turn into uh, your chance to give a, a message, which would mean we'd have to share the honorarium, and I don't want to do that with you, so I'm, jo I'm joking. But, um, but or, or I said to preach a sermon is what I meant to say. And so uh, just use that time to you know, ask, ask the question efficiently and effectively. Uh, the hardest part... Uh, well, here's what I say. The best part of, about doing ministry is having a front row seat of, of watching God change lives all the time. And so people will come up all the time and they'll be like, man, you changed my life. I'm like, dude, I am a chump from Cuero, Texas with a two-year degree in art. I promise you, I did not change your life. I'm not, I'm not that good. Uh, I, I, you know, people will say in, a, in an act of false humility, God uses me to show that he can use anyone. When I'm in bed, you know, like going to sleep, saying my prayers... I believe that with all my heart. I, I really, truly do believe that. And so just watching God change lives, interact with people, and just take them from death to life. I mean, move their eternal destination. Like, we're, like can you imagine? We're going to be in the kingdom one day. Like, all of us. And there'll be this, like, Beso reunion. Like, remember when we were in Waco that time? And it'll be, like, amazing. And I don't know what that looks like, but Jesus is going to be there. And it will be so, it was like, yeah, we talked about him. And it was cool. And, and uh, like, that excites me. I genuinely, like, look forward to that day. And the hardest part, without a doubt, the hardest part, hands down, of doing ministry is, is when you tell someone, hey, this is the way. This is the way, and they look at you, and they give you the double bird, and they say, I'm going to go this way. They fall off a cliff, and then they're mad at you. Then they're almost like, why didn't you tell me which way to go? And I'm like, oh, my goodness. I said, this way. This is the way to go. You want to go this way. This is the way to write it. Oh, your rules and regulations and stipulations and heavy-handed and legalism. Blah, blah. I want to do what I want to do what I want to do. And then they get hurt, and it's not fun. Like, nobody. I'll just say, I'll speak for myself. I do not like watching people hurt themselves. It's just not fun. I don't enjoy it. And so I would much rather watch people find the life in Jesus that he offers. That's good. Who else? Hey, also, uh, two of my friends, uh, Elise Young and Danny Kerr, shout out, um, just started dating back in Christmas time. Uh, what advice would you give them to uh, keep their... Uh, Give the relationship a uh, pure, what godly advice, biblical sound uh, doctrine would you uh, give them? Should like lose a bet and have to say their name? <laughs> Basically. And their phone numbers are. <laughs> That's really sweet, honestly. Yeah. We should all be looking out for our friends that start dating like that. That's totally. awesome. Great question. I um, am not a, not a big fan of dating, you know? And I'm not, I'm not trying to kiss it goodbye. I'm, I'm trying to make it efficient and effective. 
And so we get stuck, like dating is this, you guys have heard this, assuming you've listened to the podcast, dating is a new idea. About 120 years old, uh, the, the word was born as a euphemism for prostitution. And we still date in a way that is prostitution, by and large, in the world. And I do not think that's a God-honoring way to do that. And so, and, it, and if you just tweak a few things, you can do it really effectively, but it does mean unlearning some things. You just have to start with, who do I want to marry? Like, what kind of person? And if you are answering that question as, I want them to be this tall, with this colored hair, and this shape, and this color eyes, you are not mature enough to be married. I promise you. You're just not there yet. Keep pursuing Christ. He's going to change your heart. You're going to get there. But if you begin to say, I, I want them to honor God with their words. I want them to have this kind of faith. I want them to love these kinds of things, to pursue purity, to act in this way toward God and all things, to serve in their church, to be a member. If that's what your list looks like, then dating is really, you're just like, okay, that person I'm interested in, that's the attraction piece. Like, oh, that, that kind of, there's something there. I'd like to spend some time with them. You know, it's like that simple. It's, it's not really that much. I mean, the world, Satan has twisted that chemistry and compatibility and all these things. Like, whoa, how is the spark? It really, like, what is the spark? It's just, it's just this. Hmm. She's interesting. That's it. Like the spark that's happening over here. That's right. I Look saw some spark. conversation. I'm just saying, hey. That's, that is a, you guys leave some room for the Holy Spirit over there. That's right. Uh, the, um, and so once that's there, then you're just going through that list to say, what do I, and you're all smart. Like you're all, everyone here was smart enough to get here, right? And, and so you could say, you know, you're like, wow, I was. You're all geniuses. Uh, and, and so you just, you begin to cross-reference that list and say, okay, do they, what do I need to do to figure out if they meet this list? And people say stupid things. They're like, oh, I want to observe them in all four seasons. Like, stop. No, you don't need to do that. That's weird. You, you just need to just make like, sure that they meet that list, you know? And once they meet that list, then you can commit to them. But you want to, in that dating phase, make sure that they meet that list. How do you make sure that, that you pursue purity? Like, if that's a, a struggle, and it probably is for the vast majority of us, then I just, I would date in public. Like, I wouldn't watch the rom-com on the couch lying down. That's not, it's not gonna go well for you, right? It's, that's not gone well for anybody since the history of creation, you know? No, but you didn't see Jesus and Martha doing that. It was like, hey, let's lay down and watch a Jennifer Aniston movie. You know, that's not, that, that's not, that, yeah, it's blasphemous. I mean, it's not what happened, and it's not what we should do either, right? We, we're, it, it's much more practical than that. I just want to figure out if you meet these, this list. And if you do, you want to do ministry for the rest of our lives together? So. It's awesome. And this isn't reactive to anything, but if you are answering the question, it would be so helpful if you could just keep it a little bit shorter, uh, because otherwise we're going to have to share the honorarium with you. And so, and... Uh, hello, uh, Team Nate. Um, oh my God. Okay. Um, hey, here's the deal. Here, here's the surprise. Here's the surprise of the day. So am I. I'm, I'm Team Nate too. Okay. I just don't. I just don't go public with it. So um, my question is, if Jesus was here today, would he be voting? Question mark. And then. Oh, I'm nervous. Like not not who, but like would he? Because since we're supposed to mirror Christ, wouldn't we want to follow him in everything he does? You know, we yeah. can't be perfect, but yeah. try that. So that's just my question. Yeah, would he be voting? Yeah, I think he would. I, I think he would. I don't mind answering the second question either. Like, who would he vote for? I mean, I think he would uh, do the best that he can, being completely God and putting on humanity, the hypostatic union, right? Uh, he would want to understand where are the values and the policies that most align with God's word. And that has gotten lost in a generation. I mean, it really has because there are specific issues that we care more about than others and you don't need to you don't need to care whether it's you know it, whether it's it's abortion or racism or um, sanctity of marriage like all of those things those are the usually the top you know Christian hot topic items and I think you can look at the the greater picture and just say hey who 
person's heart most aligns with God. And if, if neither candidate's Christian, and just because they say they're Christian doesn't mean they are, right? You want to say, well, where do the policies land? And, and who do I think is going to best preserve Christian values in our land because Christian values preserve our land? That is Matthew 5. That's what he's saying. When he says, when he calls you salt, he's not calling you MSG or the stuff that, um, you know, just makes your, your steak taste better. He's calling you a preservative. And, and he's not saying that you should preserve your faith. He's saying that as you live out your faith, you preserve the land. And so people say, well, we're not in a theocracy. Why do I care, you know, if there's gay marriage? Why do I care if people are, are allowing babies to die in the womb? Why do I care if not everyone is treated equal? And people have, like, like, because it's not, they don't have God's values. I say, you care about it because you're going to raise your children in this land. Yes. And the land won't be here. You know, like they're, they're, it's going to, but by that time, we're going to completely have lost it. Do you, do you know what Amsterdam was known for in the 50s? Anyone? Churches. They were not, people would come from all, in the, come from all over the world to see these massive cathedrals in Amsterdam. Do you know what Amsterdam is known for in 2022? Weed. Weed. Secularization oh. and sex trade. The red light district. You, you can walk through and you can just order up a prostitute and have any kind of sex you want. They, they've com it's complete moral decay. What happened? The Christians stopped living as Christians. When Christians stopped living as Christians, what's left behind is rot and decay. And that's, that's what's going to happen. So that's why I think Jesus would vote. Because he calls us to. He calls us to do everything within our power to be preservatives. And so that's, that's when you go into the vote. It's not like, do I like him? Do I not? Do I like her? Do I not? Am I, uh, do they, you know, do I like their style? It's, it's where do the values going to preserve the land according to what God loves? Hey, who who thinks JP should run for president in 2024? Right, I only got two more years of Question back here. He's just trying to get rid of me, guys. Hi, um, so this one might be a bit of a heavier question, um, but I want to preface by saying that I lost my grandpa to COVID, and I just want to thank you for that podcast that you made after your dad passed away. It really helped me with my grief and just going through that. Um, but with that, um, I've been navigating grief, and I feel like COVID grief has been um, just really difficult, which is how controversial it is, and navigating grief over somebody that passed away from a virus that affects people in different ways and is just um, kind of invalidated by some people and also, um, you know, my family and myself, we, you know, validate each other, but I just want to know kind of in that process how your group has been through that and how we'd encourage people who are grieving over somebody over COVID. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm terribly sorry for your loss. And I know it's, 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 it's always hard to lose someone. It's especially hard to lose someone when there's this like low hum frequency of despair in our world right now. I, I really saw COVID usher that in, in, in a number of ways. Like, I mean, there was, we just saw tremendous division, people on edge. I mean, psychiatrists and counselors and therapists are just like booked out. I mean, that job, complete job security, right? And, and so um, I, I think First of all, just to know that like our hope is not here. He, he says to the Thessalonians, you know, we, we don't mourn like other people do. And I don't even think, because that verse, some people say, well, what if they weren't a believer? It's like, I don't even think that's the, the complete um, perspective of that verse. It, it really is. We mourn knowing that Jesus is going to come back and fix all this brokenness that we see in the land. And so we have to maintain that perspective. Secondly, I think as Christians, we're tempted to think that grief is bad. And grief is not bad. Like you, you might be like, oh man, it's good weather today, the sun is out. But if it was rainy today, that's not bad weather. Like we need rain to water the crops and, and, and rain is good weather and sun is good weather, right? And in the same way, joy is good, but grief is also good. Grief is a way to honor those uh, that, that we can't converse with any longer. And so I think if we try to take that and put it in a box and never go there, uh, it, we can, that's when we can kind of get in these weird disorders. But if we look at it, we're like, man, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful 
that I loved my grandfather uh, enough to where like when, when he moves on, I don't just move on like it's, it's no thing. I'm thankful that I love my father in such a way that I can create time and space to weep, to, to feel sadness, to miss him. You know, they're, they're, like I'm still with my wife, like she's still alive, but when I travel, I miss her. And the essence of me missing her points to the reality that we have a healthy marriage, that we love each other. And so me missing my father is a good thing. And in the scriptures, they would actually create time and space to do that. They were, they were much better, better at it than we are today in America and, and in most countries uh, in, in the world today. So we, we just wanna, we wanna move on. So I would say, you know, create that, those space and, and know that sometimes grief hits you at a strange time. And when it does, lift your eyes beyond the horizon and, and know that we have hope that Jesus is going to come back. And the first thing that he says is, you know, I'm going to wipe away all the tears. And that's like just, just this beautiful picture. Like one time I stumbled upon, uh, upon this uh, child who was lost at like a fair. And, I, and he was just screaming his head off, you know. And, and I, you know, and I tried to like go to him, but he was like stranger danger, you know. Ah! And I was like, no. And like, so I got down on his level. You know, I kneel down, and I'm like, hey, buddy, I'm here. I'm going to help you find your parents. I've got no, I'm, there's nothing else I'm going to do. I'm just going to help you find your parents. You okay if I pick you up? We're going to go up there, and we're going to look for your mom, okay? And I pick him up, and I hold him close. I'm like, hey, I'm not going to let you go until I get you home, okay? You don't, and he's just screaming in my ear. Ah! I'm like, hey, I'm not going to let you go until I get you home. I'm not going to let you go until I get you home. And I climb up on top of this park bench, and we're just looking. And, and, his, and this lady, like on the other side of the crowd, like locks eyes with me and sees her son and just cuts through that crowd. And I hand him over to her. And the first thing she does is just wipe away those tears. She just grabs him, you know, and holds him close and wipes his face. And I think that's like a little bit what we experience here is just this deep brokenness, all kinds of sadness, despair, depression, anxiety, loss disease, heartbreak, and, and the Holy Spirit is like, hey, I'm not going to let you go until I get you home. I'm not going to let you go until I get you home. I'm not going to let you go until I get you home. And then the first thing Jesus does, he grabs you, pulls you close, and just wipes away the tears. He's like, hey, you're home now. You're home. You're home. I think that perspective is important to remember. So good. Right over here. Hi. Hey. Um, how do you lead others to Jesus in a community or a workplace that's so focused on political correctness in today's okay. age. Yeah. Wait, go, go one more on PC. You mean like you can't talk about your faith? Is that what you're, is that what you're insinuating? Um, yeah, like it's very like secular minded, very focused on like what the world worships, not so much like what Christians do. Yeah, man, I love that. So in that same verse in Matthew 5, it calls it salt and what's the other thing he says? Light. light, right. And so, you know, Monica and I are building a house, and, and we're in this phase right now where we're, we're figuring out where lights go. The funny thing about lights, man, they are expensive, okay? <laughs> and, and so, you know, it's like I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, hey, where do we put them? And I'm like, it, they, they had three in a bathroom. I'm like, let's just do one really bright one, you know? And we'll, we'll put a mirror right beside it and, and we'll figure it out. And like all, over the stairs, they wanted to put four lights. It's like, we don't need four lights. And they were like, but your kids are gonna be coming down those at night. And I was like, they're resilient, you know? It's, <laughs> like, it's fine, we'll buy them flashlights, you know? <laughs> because they're expensive. Well, what's funny about that is in the, in the first century, lights were also very expensive. And that's why he says no one's going to put a light, uh, light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Like you're going to put it where it gives the whole house light, he says. And so God is this master builder and he's identifying dark places and he's putting the brightest lights there. Make no mistake about it. Your job is to shine. Okay, you can shine your little hiney all the way out the door if, if they, they want you to. Like if they don't want you to shine, you, you, you're a light. You can't not shine, but do so. In, in the words of a dear friend of mine who has since passed away, you have to winsomely engage. You, you got to be winsome. You, you have to be as sly as a serpent and as innocent as a dove. Like, you don't go up there and, oh, my job's to shine. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, hey, you ask great questions. You bring people in. You serve others. Where everyone is there is like, hey, that person. 
Like, like the, we need more of them. I love this story about a young man who his company worked for a Fortune 500 company and they threatened to fire him every single year because he was so uh, verbose with his faith. Like he was so loud with his faith. But every year he got double promoted because he was so diligent in his work. Mm. And that's the picture. That is the picture because usually Christians are loud but lazy, okay, Ooh. right? Or they, or they work hard but they're quiet. But you gotta strike that balance of I work really hard, I serve everyone around me, everyone loves me, I, you know, and I'm gonna tell them about Jesus at every turn and you need to know, and I tell teachers this too, I bet you there's some teachers in the room. The yeah. Ki yeah. The king's heart is like a, I mean, yeah, the king's heart is like a water course in the Lord's hand. He directs it wherever he pleases. God is in charge of what happens to you. They cannot fire you apart from God's will. My mother has taught in the public schools since I was tiny. I mean, so, I mean, all my life, all my life, my mom has taught, so really tiny. Uh, all my life, my mom's taught in the public schools, and all my life, she has shared her faith faithfully in that classroom. And, you know, and she's just... What are they going to do, fire me? You know, I'll find another teaching job, I guess. You know, it's okay. It's not, I'm not, it's, it's not, I'm not, it's not the end of the world if that happens. And again, but don't do it in a way that is obnoxious. You have to do it in a way that's faithful. That's good. Okay, question back here. Yes, I want to ask a question about tithing. Yeah. So I want to honor God. The, the giving boxes are right back there. <laughs> I want to honor God with my finances, and I wanted to ask your thoughts on whether the whole tithe needs to go to your local church, or if part of it can go to other ministries that contribute to your life. Yeah, it's great. Like, where, what does tithing look like? And so this is, this is a, I get this every Friday. You know, you wouldn't believe it. One of the most frequently asked questions on Friday is around tithing. And so let me just kind of, back up and say tithing is really an Old Testament principle. Like so giving a tenth, that's where we get that word tithe, is an Old Testament principle. The New Testament principle comes from 1 Corinthians 9 where it says each person has, uh, should give what they have determined in their heart to give for the Lord li loves a cheerful giver. And it's not a, a 10%, like Jesus didn't tithe his blood you know, toward, toward our sins, like he gave all of himself. And really what we want to do is it starts, stewardship begins with seeing everything that I have belongs to God. And I'm his financial advisor, you know. He, for whatever reason, allows me to spend some of his money. He gives me some of his money. And so the first question I, I ask is not what should I give, but what should I keep? And when I say, what should I keep? It really is, what should I keep that would allow me to be generous with things like ministries that have impacted my life? Uh, my neighbors, caring for my family, um, sharing things with other people. Like we should ask those kinds of questions first. And once we've determined, hey, this is what the Lord wants me to keep, we should give to our local church and hopefully, this is where it gets weird. Like your local church is probably giving to those ministries too. And that's, that's what's, you know, a challenge that I face is, as we lead and serve within a local church is, is people give here, they expect us to give there, and they give there too. But who is the church? The church is the people. So like if, um, you know, there's a, if there's a ministry here, so let's just say Waco Ministry, and a member of Harris Creek gives to that ministry, that actually is, through the eyes of God, a biblical worldview Harris Creek giving to that local ministry because someone at Harris Creek gave to them. Or you could also choose a strategy where your church vets a lot of ministries. They choose, you know, two to ten that they want to partner with, and you give to your church and they give to that. And so it kind of depends on how that church is ran. But this is what I want to make sure young people know, and I'm not just saying this because I'm a quote-unquote lead pastor. Uh, I, I would have said this ten years ago. A lot of times we don't realize that, you know, that a church is a non-profit, meaning they don't earn a, a profit. They exist. Everything that you receive from that church exists because people have given generously to it. So like today, 
you get to enjoy those chairs. People who've gone before you paid for them. We have central air and heat. That's a large bill every single week. People here have made that investment in you. And we don't think about that because we just, you know, we just take and take things for granted and, and whatnot. But those, that's, that's through the tithes or offerings of faithful people. And so can you give to other ministries? Yes. Should you prioritize the local body that you're a part of? Yes. In the same way that in Acts 2, they came together, they had all things in common. The way that we do that now is through corporate membership of a local body. Like Paul wrote to the Corinth, the church in Corinth, or the church in Thessalonica, or the church in Galatia, or the church in Philippi. That, that local body that cared for one another. I think that's the right picture of the church today. So, so I'm standing over here and I'm really wondering how the date's going, but I can't see yes. it. Is there any way that the rest of Inquiring us can kind of see how things are going over there? Uh... Well, I don't want me. I, I know I look good. I want to see how they're doing. Okay, whatever. Our camera guys, they, they were up late last night. Anyway. Thanks, JP. Uh, can you discuss daily calling versus like a life calling? Yeah. You know, calling is one of those words that, that I think we probably made more of than the scripture does. And which is, you know, that's weird. That's kind of the air we breathe. And um, I know, I think Oz Guinness wrote a book called The Calling or Calling. It might be worth checking out if this is of interest to you. Um, we are daily called to faithfulness. Someone asked yesterday as we were um, talking about potential po uh, topics for the podcast, what does success look like for as a Christian? In one word, is faithfulness. The bullseye is always faithfulness. So how do I know if I live the day to day, if I live today in a way that honors God? It's like, was I faithful with what God had for me? So uh, success is not convert. Success is not, you know, a certain number of disciples, a certain way a church grows. It's was I faithful with what the Lord gave me? We say silly things in Christianity. We'll be like, speed of the leader, speed of the team. <laughs> I would say faithfulness of the leader faithfulness of the team. Like, how can we be faithful? And so that's the day-to-day -day calling. And I think the way that the day-to-day -day calling plays into your life calling is so often God wants to use you where you're at to reach the people around you. And there's a story. There's a professor, Professor Kavanaugh. He's overseas. He's caring for the poor. He's on mission. He used to teach at a university. He's talking to his friends. It's a true story. It's not a joke. He was talking to his friend and he said, man, I don't know what I should do. Should I go back to the States and, and go back to the university or should I continue to, to remain overseas and serve the poor? And he goes, I wish I could talk to Mother Teresa. <laughs> and his friend goes, man, that's crazy because I actually have her number. Like somebody gave me Mother Teresa's number the other day. I was at this thing and I have it. And, and it's true story. And so he's like, here's her number, call her. And so the professor, professor Kavanaugh calls, calls this number, this kind of feeble, Older voice answers the phone, hello? And he's like, may I speak with Mother Teresa? And this is she. And, and he's like, Mother Teresa, I was, I was hoping you could pray for me. And she says, sure, what would you like me to pray for? And he says, clarity. He, and, she, and he says, I'm, I'm overseas caring for the poor right now, but I don't know if I should return to the States and teach. Would you pray for clarity? And she says, no. Mm. And, and she mean? says, I will not pray for clarity. And he goes, oh, oh, and she goes, we're, we're not promised clarity. And he goes, oh, I thought you always had clarity that you're caring for the lepers in Calcutta. And, and she said, no, I woke up in Calcutta this morning and there were lepers around me, so I will care for them. So good. She said, she said, the Lord doesn't give us clarity, he gives us faith to walk in whatever circumstances he has for us. Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he's prepared in advance for us to do. It's actually to walk in the poetry that God has written ahead of time for us to walk in. Mm -hmm. It would be a, a kind of word for word uh, translation of that scripture. And so I, I think that um, sometimes calling looks like a road to Damascus experience. Like you stop, you hear the audible voice of the Lord. He says, you're going to do this. In full transparency, that's what mine looked like. Mm -hmm. In fuller transparency, as crazy as that sounds, 
I didn't do it. I delayed it. Like in the midst of all of this certainty, there was still doubt in my heart and I delayed obedience, which is disobedience. And I think so for most of you, calling will look like you walking faithfully where God has placed you. You being aware of the people around you and you serving them in the name of Jesus. Okay, I've got a question back here. Hi, so since being, I'm over here, sorry. Um, since being like born again, I feel like this has been one of my biggest issues is wrestling between like respecting my parents that aren't active in their faith, but also like trying to share the gospel with them or like what's the line that's too far? Or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so great. So how do, you, how do you share the gospel? We actually did do a podcast on this um, around Christmas time, I believe. But parents are the hardest, man. I just want to say that Jesus says a prophet is not welcome in his own town. And I, I think sometimes we can really feel that. And because you never, if you're the, the youngest, you know, a four, it feels like you never outgrow that title. Or if you're the oldest who struggled with whatever, you know, it's just like those labels, they, they stick to you. You go off to college, you go back home, but they still see you as that. And you're like, no, but I'm grown up now. And so the greatest thing, like strategically, I think what you can do, step one, is show them something different, okay? And people say, well, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, do the dishes, okay? Like just real practical. You want to show them that you've grown up, you walk into that home and, and you just start serving. You take out the trash, you do the dishes, you vacuum the floor without asking. That in your mom, that, that switch will flip and she's like, oh my goodness, where did this woman come from? You know, and, and dudes do the same thing. Like, like you go out, you mow the lawn or do whatever. You can do the same thing. The dishes, take out the trash, all the things, vacuum the floor. And, and your parents are like, my goodness, this is no longer a boy. This is a man. And, and, then, there, and then what happens is they're like, what got into you? You in love, you know? And you're like, yeah, his name is Jesus. You know? and, uh, and you just say, you say, here's what happened. Like, God has legit changed my life. And so they're not going to, apart from that, you're just going to be a nag, right? You're going to be the, hey, when are you guys going to go to church? And it's going to frustrate them because they're going to be like, hey, you're the kid, not the parent. Like, don't tell us what to do. And now we're not going to go to church just because you said it and it would be weird for us to listen to you. And so because you told us to go to church, we're definitely not going to go. And then you get in that weird dynamic. So step one, you serve like crazy. And then you guys know, I mean, I'm a one trick pony. Like I love the Kennedy question. So I asked my dad, who was a devout Catholic. Hey dad, so I ask everybody these questions, you know, and I'd love to just, you know, see what your take is on them. Between one and 10, 10 being certain, one being not so sure. If you died today, how certain are you that you would go to heaven? And I was like, I don't know, what? why are you asking me? I'm like, dad, I'm like, just hear me, between one and 10, what would you say? So like, I guess a seven. I was like, okay, you stood before God. And he said, why should I let you in, what would you say? And he's like, I, because I, I've gone to church and I follow the sacraments and I do, you know, do this and that. And I said, hey, Dad, would you be interested? So, this, so I've been hanging out in this, I don't know if you know this, but I teach the Bible for a living now. And <laughs> I'd love to share with you what the Bible actually says if you were interested. And it just gave us a great opportunity to walk through the gospel. Can you imagine, to, based you know, on her question earlier, do you know how thankful I am that I pushed through all the awkwardness and the weirdness that I got to have that conversation with my dad. I mean, that, like me speaking at his funeral was very different. That's the story I told at his funeral, uh, at his memorial service was, was about that. And so push through the awkwardness. I know it is hard, but have the conversation, but you wanna lay the groundwork of serving first. That's good. Hello. Um... I, I want to, I have a desire to go to the Middle East and be a medical missionary and, uh, and be a dental hygienist. And I was wondering, how do you determine um, if that desire is from God or is that desire is, uh, just you? Yeah, it's such a great question. So I have a desire to do missions uh, and mission work overseas, but how do I know if that's me or if that's God? He says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And so I think start one is just like, just, just an acknowledgement, God, my greatest desire is to serve you wherever I'm at. Like, sure, like there are places I'd rather be than, than others, but uh, I want you to know I'm willing to go. 
And then we, we start to get in this weird place where we're like, gosh, why would God not want you to go to be a dental hygienist in a place where they need dental hygienists overseas, you know? And in the name of the gospel, it seems like that makes a lot of sense. I don't know. His Holy Spirit who sees the future and he sees all future circumstances may be protecting you from something, uh, may want you to be surrounded by people who love you here, may want to continue to develop you in, in a particular church. I'll tell you a story. You know that, that I almost moved to Waco um, a time in the past before I actually was in ministry. There was a job here. A friend of mine was running a company, and he had, he had invited me to come and be vice president, which was a total head check. So I'm like, vice president at, at, at 21? Like, this is amazing. Like, why wouldn't I not? <laughs> I've got to go do this. And I was processing it with somebody who, who was mentoring me at the time, discipling me at the time. And he just said, hey, if you move to Waco, and this is wildly successful, and the company goes public, and you have all this money and you can give so much away and all of this, was it God's will? And he was, I was like, yeah, absolutely. And he goes, okay, well, if you move to Waco and the company folds, uh, it goes under, files chapter 11, and you, know, you're, you, you lose everything, you're homeless on the streets, you know, begging for food, was it God's will? I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> it's not what God wants. And he goes, he goes, I think you're determining God's will based on the outcome, right? We cannot determine obedience by the outcome. And I learned that very valuable lesson right there. We cannot determine obedience by the outcome. We determine obedience, again, by what his scripture says and then walking in faithfulness around us. If God, the, the great thing about you is you're not going to miss it. If God wants you to go overseas, as you look for opportunities to go overseas, he's going to create a way for you. And if you look back at that moment where the Lord called me to ministry, I go and I, I hire an attorney and I start a 501c3 or I'm starting a 501c3 and my, a buddy more mature than me, more spiritually mature than me says, hey, why don't you pray about it? I pray for five days and on the fifth day, the church calls and offers me a job. And like, I'm like, what? Like, why is this happening? I never even considered working for a church. But I think as you pray about it and as you seek to do what you desire and you delight yourself in the Lord, he's going to direct your steps. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. He's going to push you in the direction of his will. It's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. That's good. Okay, up here. All right, so our question is... Not in it alone. <laughs> no, 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 they've been waiting for this too. How do we uh, understand or navigate someone who is on fire for Jesus and walked away from their faith? Yeah. Yeah. Man, it's so hard. You know, in James, in James, he talks about, you know, turning a sinner from his ways and, and saving them from, from a multitude of sin, from, from a greater tragedy. And then Hebrews and in and, and First Timothy talks about this idea, these, these weird verses that seem to say that you can lose your salvation. And, and then we play these weird Arminian Calvinist games like, oh, were they just never saved in the first place or did they stray from grace? And, and I'm, I'm firmly in the camp of um, you can't do something to lose something you did nothing to get, right? That, and so people say, well, can I lose my salvation? And I say, well, if you did anything to get it, sure. But if you know where you found it, then you'll always know where to find it, right? And, and it's, it's found in one name under heaven, which is Jesus. And so I think for that person, you know, that Matthew 18, 15 through 17, that whole passage ends with you. You treat them like a pagan or a tax collector, which we should ask the question, well, how do we treat pagans and tax collectors? And, and the answer is you share the gospel with them. Right? And, and in some ways, when someone denounce, when someone is living as a pagan and they denounce the faith, it's easier. Because I can still fellowship with that person. Fellowship is the wrong word. I can still hang out with that person, eat with that person. You know, I can still enjoy life with that person, be friends with that person. First Corinthians 5 tells me that if someone calls themselves a brother or sister, but they are engaged in worldly activity, you know, they're, they're sleeping around, they're doing what they want to do. It says, with such a person, do not even eat. So that's another line. Like if someone is, is calling themselves a Christian, but they're, you know, they're not living as a Christian, I can't fellowship with that person. 
If someone is saying, hey, I'm no longer a Christian and I'm not living as a Christian, I can still love that person and share the gospel with that person. And, and be careful not to get frustrated. These are emotional conversations. And, and too often, friends, our desire to control kicks in. And we really get frustrated that we can't, you know, be the Holy Spirit in that moment and turn their heart back on. And you can't. And I don't know if, I don't know if they're saved and they're going to get to heaven, but they're kind of going through this phase. I don't know if they were never saved in the first place and, and, and they will be. I don't know. I can't see a, a person, a man or woman's heart. But I know my job doesn't change. My job is to love them and to share faithfully with them and to not be given, uh, not to sin in my anger toward them or desire to control them. But just be a road sign. Hey, this is the way. Remember that the, the discouraging conversation? What's the most discouraging thing in ministry? It's like, I'm just going to be a road sign. Road signs are unemotional. You know, they're like, hey, you know that little arrow that says like 45 miles an hour underneath and it has those little arrows? That sign says, if you take this curve faster than 45 miles an hour, you're going to die. Okay. And it's just, it's not mad at me. The sign's not mad at me. It's just like, hey, you can go 55. You just might flip. Kill your whole family. You know? And, and they're like, well, I don't want to do that. Right? And the sign's just telling me. The sign's saying, hey, this is the way. This is the way. This is the way. And that's, I think, sometimes that's our greatest metaphors like we're just a road sign we're firmly planted saying hey buddy this is the way this is the way this is the way you want to know the way it's this way i have to stand up nope <laughs> you good <laughs> just kidding okay sorry okay okay so i feel like a topic we don't cover enough as christians like in depth and something that's super important to like how to put the armor on and guard against it. It's spiritual warfare. And I know you mentioned that you're talking about it here at church, but I think it's something that we kind of briefly touch on. And there are things that like in Daniel, the story of like the Prince of Persia and things like that, that like I never noticed and like how in depth, I guess, spiritual warfare is. So like, do you ever plan to talk about that? Like super in depth, I've been saying that a lot, but <laughs> on the podcast? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, did we do one on it? We oh. actually talked about doing it yeah. Next week, I think. Well, you, I mean, you're preaching like that yeah. sermon in like two yeah. weeks. So, so we probably yeah. will so talk about it. I mean, we are, in a, we are in a six-week series on spiritual warfare. You guys can, I'm not like trying to like push our stuff on you, but Harris Creek app, it's free. You can go listen or watch. They're all on YouTube, those messages. And we started talking about the king of Tyre, right, Ezekiel 28. We talked about the, we started with the fall of Satan. And, uh, and, and so we're, we've been just hanging out in the Old Testament. Then we went Job 1. And so we're kind of jumping as we move toward Easter into the New Testament to, to talk about an exorcism this week. And so, uh, yeah. And so, I mean, it's, it's pretty in-depth, if you will, on spiritual warfare. There's some great resources out there. And absolutely, we'll do a podcast on it. And you're right. Like, it's not talked about enough. That's why I wanted to do the series. And it's real. Like, the battles that we fight, Ephesians 6, are not of flesh and blood, uh, but against rulers and principalities. And there, there, are, there are demons and angels at, at war around us and and satan is given authority here on this earth and and that's why you're just not mad when sinners sin i'm i'm mad at Satan. we have one enemy just one like we have one enemy it's not your mother-in-law it's not your your boyfriend's mom it, it's not you know it's not um it's not the, your your rival friend right or whatever you have one enemy and he's satan and he is, he is leading an army against God. And the, and the weapons that we fight with are prayer, right? Jesus says, hey, stay awake and pray while I'm here. And, and the word, it's the offensive, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's the only offensive weapon that we have. And so when Jesus is tempted, he, he responds four times. He, he responds with scripture from his memory verses from Deuteronomy. Could you imagine if the only way you're going to defeat Satan and resist temptation a day is by throwing some memory verses from Deuteronomy at him? You know, yeah. a lot of us are going to be in some trouble, right? <laughs> and so I, th I do think it's important. That's good. Okay, JP, we have one right back here. Hi, so um, I have a friend back home who uh, likes the same gender. How would you like preach to them or meet them in the middle? So you have a friend who identifies as gay? Yeah. And, and um, uh, struggles with homosexuality. By the way, they said Corey and Brady won. And I was like, 
Oh, I didn't know where's that kind of podcast. <laughs> but uh, just glad. Just glad Brady, great to meet you. Good to meet you. Uh, man, he, he, here's the deal. Check this out. You love your friend like crazy, man. You, you love your friend like crazy. And, and here's what you didn't say, like, and, I, and I saw I'll address both. I don't know if your friend is, identifies as a Christian also, but if they do, right, if somebody is a Christian, then I go to the scriptures. But if they're not a Christian, like, they should be having all kinds of crazy sex and orientations and desires and all the things. Like, that's what, like, why? Like, I can't even believe when I was not a Christian and dwelt by the Holy Spirit, I'm like, what stopped me from being crazier? Like, I mean, I was crazy, but I'm like, I don't know what stopped me. I mean, I did coke and ecstasy, but I never did heroin. I don't know why. You know, I really, I have no idea. I don't know why God stopped me. Like, common grace. You know, I, I slept around, but I, I'm just surprised I didn't sleep around more. I, I just, I don't understand. I mean, it was, com it was truly, it was God's common grace. And so if someone is not into what with the Holy Spirit, I'm not at all talking to them about the morality I, I'm loving them. I'm, I'm putting them at my, at my table. Uh, if, hey, you need a spare bedroom because I got one. You need some money because the last time I checked, we had a little bit in the savings. I'm happy to share it with you. And by the way, I know how you can live forever. And, and it is Jesus Christ. God loved you so much. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to die for your sins. And he raised him from the dead. And, and it, there is no other name in all of heaven by which you can be saved. And one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And I can share this with you with boldness and courage because I know that one day you're going to see that I was right. And I am not in any way trying to convince you that you're not gay. I'm trying to convince you that you are so much more than gay. That you can be a child of God. That he loves you. He's crazy about you. And he paid a price for you. And I think to your to your conversation about the workplace over here, we're so scared. Even the way, you know, so we just have that little band, like, oh my goodness, did he just say that? And, and so, what's gonna happen? Is he gonna get canceled? I don't, I don't know, but that's a, my, my goal is not to not be canceled. My goal is to be faithful. I wanna be faithful, you know? And that, that's what we, what we have to do in all of those things. I think we're out of time, right? I, yeah. I think, okay. One more question. Um, I know, it's a bummer. I, I want to do this all the time. We do do it every Friday, uh, just so you know. Friday Q&A, that's a real thing on, in, on the old Instagram. Uh, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for us. And um, what's going to happen after I do that? Uh, Bree's going to come out and, and tell them. Oh, okay. I know, but... Yeah, yeah. You know, but you're your friend. I just, uh, yeah, I'd rather have she yeah, heard yeah. you. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Uh, good. Huh? <laughs> but, so what, what would your answer be? <laughs> yes. Yes. What are we talking? <laughs> I got really distracted. I'm trying to help with this bingo. No. What do you need to yeah. say? Uh, welcome to adulting. Okay. Yeah. Um, bingo. What, what just What's happened right there? I don't know what happened, Nate. Were y'all doing something? I was talking. He, he was so literally honest. about to pray, and you said, I would pray. Yes. <laughs> Are you serious? Truly. <laughs> so funny. That was shocking. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pray for real right now. <laughs> Father, you have a desire on all things, on, on workspace, on relationships, on discipleship, on truth that's shared, on sexual orientation, on sharing the gospel with our family members. Like you, you, there's, there's something in heaven that you're cheering for in, in all of those circumstances. And I just pray that you would tune our heart, that the power of your Holy Spirit would allow us to hear and to know what your desire is through the reading of your scriptures, the preaching of your word, uh, the, the living in community, that we would just have a greater understanding of what your desire is and that we would boldly live it out in, in a way that is winsome and loving and seasoned with grace. 
and all the things that you tell us in your word. God, as, 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 as there's too much of my personality sprinkled in to that little Q&A, if, if, there's, if there's things that are of me but not of you, I pray that they are forgotten before they stand up and, and, and our amazing tech team edits them out and no one ever hears them. But if there's things that I share that are consistent with your character and your Holy Spirit, I pray that they would stir in our hearts and create change in our lives so that we would be the men and the women that you desire us to be in the cities that you've placed us in, in the companies and the coffee shops and the cafes and the school uh, the schools that you've placed us in, in, in the apartment buildings and the neighborhoods that you've placed us in, that we would be lights there knowing that you've pushed us, you've put us there to push back darkness and that we would do so faithfully. Thank you that we can have fun in this way. You're so good to us. We love you in Jesus name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for letting us hang out like this. Thanks for tuning in to Becoming Something where we promise to keep the conversation honest and real for young adults in their 20s and 30s. Every moment we live is training for a future moment, and that's why we do this podcast, because we want you to be prepared for everything that life is going to throw at you. Our hope with this podcast is that it would help you become all that God desires you to be. To find out more, visit becomingsomething.com.